Hi, I'm Mike Ward. I want to talk to you about the weighted average cost of capital. Now you will know that this is the discount rate at which we like to discount the free cash flows that a company will produce when we're trying to value the company. Now it makes sense that the lower the weighted average cost of capital, or WAC as we typically call it, the higher the value of the company will be. And I want to focus in particular on what uh, Miller Medigliani, two famous researchers, came up with in 1958 when they focused on what we refer to as the optimal capital structure for a company. So let me show you what we're talking about. We assume that a company's got assets which generate free cash flows, which we want to discount back. But the, uh, and we're not going to change the assets, that's going to be assumed to be constant for now. But what we do want to focus on is how these assets are funded. If we finance the assets with equity, which is more expensive than debt, we're going to have a high whack. So we tend to put in some debt. But how much debt should we put in? That's what they looked at. So they explored this mix between equity and debt, uh, debt being cheaper, particularly after tax. And that's what I want to show you. Now, what they did was they started off with their first proposition, and it's a good place to start, in what they called a world without taxes. Now, you and I know that tax, like death, is inevitable, but in fact, it's not quite true. Death is inevitable, but taxes, in fact, sometimes are small or may not happen at all. If you happen to locate your company in a tax haven, like the British Virgin Isles or Mauritius or one of those places, Ireland, for example, or also if you run up an assessed loss over many years, you may either be paying no tax for some time or you may have a very low tax rate. So it's not inconceivable. Now, on this axis over here, the y-axis, I want to show you what happens to the cost of capital, uh, the WAC, if you like. And on this axis over here, we're going to be looking at how much debt we put into the company, assuming that we start with zero and we're going to gear it up to 100%. Now, what M&M did was they started off by defining this point over here as being the cost of capital if you fund the company entirely with equity. I've called it the cost of equity with a little u here, meaning unleave it. What they showed is that as you put in more debt, so the cost of equity, this is the cost of equity I'm talking about here, went up. The cost of debt, interest rates if you like, is given, it's fixed. Now, they, this, this line is, is a straight line and the equation which defines it in fact looks like this here. You will recognize the beta here of the company here and uh, this beta here is the levered company, uh, the, the levered beta, which is what you measure empirically when you actually calculate a beta from the stock market here, because companies already have debt in them. Uh, but there is a relationship between what the company's beta would be without any debt down here, it'll be lower. And as you put in more and more debt over here, you, you find that this equation defines this line. Now, although we're in a world without taxes here, this, this doesn't change anything here because one minus zero is just one. And so you can see here that this equation simply says the levered beta of the company will be equal to what it was without any debt in times one plus the debt to equity ratio, in this case, times one, since there's no tax. Now, um, so, so that's our starting point. We, we use this equation. In fact, we, we can plot any point on this line here just by rearranging these terms if we want to and uh, calculating where we are. Now, what m and showed was that as you put in more debt into the company, debt being cheaper than equity, the cost of equity, the re return required by shareholders, increases, but not the whack. Now, debt is cheaper. But in fact, the weighted average cost of capital doesn't change. That is because the shareholders want a higher uh, return to offset the extra risk they take because debt has to be paid first. And it so happens, and they proved, they proved this and showed this empirically, that in fact, the extra risk that shareholders take is exactly offset by the cheaper debt. And so there's no advantage to taking on more debt if you're not paying tax. Now that's unusual, but it's a good starting point. 
Much more relevant to us is what happens in a world without, sorry, with, with taxes. And uh, so we're going to look at that. Now, first of all, uh, equity still increases as we put in uh, in a world with, uh, with taxes over here. But the cost of debt after tax now, because we're going to be uh, paying less tax, if we factor that in here, we might be, say, paying uh, in South Africa, say, 9% debt. Uh, uh, over here, it would be after tax, we'd take it down to about 6% because we're saving a little bit on tax. If we factor that in, what they showed was the weighted average cost of capital comes down. But it doesn't keep coming down. At some point, it starts to turn and starts to increase again. And this is because of what we refer to as the cost of bankruptcy. As you take on more financial risk in a company, the chances of you going insolvent because that is defined by you not being able to pay interest, increases. And so we have to factor in the cost of lawyers and liquidation costs and legal effects and so on. And uh, so down here, there is an optimal range. And that's what we're aiming for. If we can get this a company structured down here somewhere, we will get the highest valuation for the company's cash flows. Now, this optimal range that we're referring to here, you'll notice the curve is pretty flat, so we've got quite a lot of play in here. We would prefer not to be on this side, actually, because the further you go down here, and, and, and remember, insolvency can happen very abruptly, uh, it gets dangerous. We'd rather play on this side, but anywhere here is going to be fine. It's pretty flat over here. Now, this optimal range is different for different industries. I'm simply illustrating it here for you in general. And in fact, I'm, I'm exaggerating it a, it a fair bit here. It's not going to ever get down to quite the levels I'm showing you over here. But if you happen to be in a business where the business risk itself is very high, so that might be something like shipping where there are very high fixed costs or mining where there's commodities risk and so on, this curve is going to look different. You're going to find that you get to that optimal range a whole lot more quickly. In fact, those kinds of businesses, because there's high business risk, should not take on too much debt. Conversely, other businesses where there's low business risk are going to find they can, in fact, take on a lot more debt than they probably should. These would be businesses where the cash flows are much more uh, certain and less volatile. So we're talking about things uh, like healthcare, uh, some financial services type businesses, and many others. So, but the principles are still the same. We're looking for the, the sweet spot, if you like, for each business. Now, having said that, I want to show you how this works in Excel with just a little quick example. But before I do that, I just want to draw your attention to this piece of research, which came out, in fact, in 2016 uh, in the Journal of Financial Economics, where basically they actually looked to see what they thought the optimal cost of capital ought to be, and then they went to go and have a look at what companies were actually using, what was the capital structure they were using, and what was their cost of capital here. And you can see there are very few below the line here. And uh, what they reported here uh, is that despite the theory, firms typically use a weighted average cost of capital, which is double what it should be. That means they're not taking on enough debt. And in South Africa, it's probably worse than it is in the UK because we tend to avoid debt more. The reason for that is generally thought to be, well, simply because uh, managers feel the burden of debt. They stay awake at night, they worry about the high interest uh, costs and the funding of the debt and so on. So it's tempting for them not to do that. In fact, shareholders need to push them to take on more debt. But let me, let me show you uh, very quickly here, if I just uh, click into Excel here, I've got a little model here which I want to show you how this works. Now we've got two companies, A and B, and at the moment they're exactly the same. The operating cash flow, before we finance the company, we're just going to put in some numbers here, I'm assuming is 900, let's say, euros for now. If the tax rate is 30%, and you'll see down here, here's their balance sheet over here, there's no debt at the moment, they're fully equity funded, and we're assuming just for this example, 4,000 euros worth of, of equity here, then the tax on this at 30% will be 270 euros. Now, uh, what Miller and Medigliani showed is they said that, in fact, this 900 here, the cash flow, the operating cash flow, is split between three stakeholders. The shareholders obviously get some of it. The bondholders, debt holders, I've referred to them here as, 
also get a chunk, nothing here because there is no debt. But the third slice, if you like, goes to the receiver of revenue. And this has to always add up to 900 uh, euros, whatever the operating cash flow was up here. Now, you will observe as well that the cost of equity in this instance here, we're just defining it as at 15%, cost of unlevered equity. And since there's no debt, that's what it looks like. Cost The WAC is also 15%. Now, if we assume that the company pays uh, earns this 900 euros every single year forever without any growth, we can capitalize these cash flows here by 15% to get the value of the equity and the value of the debt. And it comes to, in this case, 4.2 or 4,200, if you like. Now, I want you to see what happens as we start putting in some debt. So it, as I add debt here, and I'm just going to ratchet this up a bit here, uh, you'll notice if you look at the balance sheet here that we haven't increased the assets. We're still sitting on a, a balance sheet size of 4,000 euros, but we have in fact funded it differently. In practice, what we would have done with, is we would have raised, in this case, 1,000 euros in debt, and that would have given us assets of 5,000 because we'd have cash sitting on the other side of the balance sheet, but we're going to take that cash and repurchase some shares. So the shares have come down. The share buyback, if you like. That's what we're doing. Now, notice the operating cash flow doesn't change, but the we now have to pay the bondholders. And so the cost of debt times this is going to mean they get 100 of this. And notice that the tax has gone down as well. That's because the interest is tax deductible. But you'll also notice, though, that shareholders are, in fact, getting less uh, less of the money. If you look down here, you can see the shareholders get the net income here. They're only getting 560. But the good news is there are fewer shareholders because we've reduced the equity component by, by a quarter. And uh, so we've got now only three quarters of it financed by equity and one quarter financed by debt. So the uh, earnings per share, despite the lower earnings, is in fact higher. That's interesting. You'll also notice down here that the weighted average cost of capital has gone down. That's because we're still sliding down that little uh, slope. And the value of the company, because we've got a cheaper whack, which we're discounting these cash flows at, has in fact increased. So we're heading towards our op optimal capital structure. As I keep on adding more and more debt, I want you to keep an eye on this interest cover ratio over here, for example, and in fact on this value over here. And you'll see as I put in more and more debt, did you notice it, it, it turned down? I'm going back one step. At an interest cover of about five times, the value of the business actually optimized at about 4,800, 4, if you like. Now, I can show you what that looks like graphically over here. You can see here's our WAC coming down steadily over here. And we get to some optimal point somewhere around over here. And at that point, risks of bankruptcy creep in. And at the same time here, this is the value of the company. It goes up and up and up, and it, it reaches some peak over here. So that's what happens. Now, what drives this here, uh, and I'm going to end with this here, is what happens to the cost of debt. Now, you can see here, uh, this is the amount of debt that we put in here. I'm just showing you this on a little table over here. And over here, uh, is the cost of debt. We start off with interest rates at about 10%. And for a while, the bondholders are not too worried about financial risk. So they don't, they don't, uh, they, they keep the rate pretty much what it was. This is just illustrative. But what happens as we increase the gearing, we find that the interest cover starts to drop. The rating agencies, having rated this company initially as triple A, start to lower their ratings over here. We move from triple A, if you like, to triple B. What that then does is the debt gets re-rated. And instead of it costing 10%, it's going to cost 11%. And what does that do? Well, it starts to flow through into the WAC equation over here. And you'll notice that the, although WAC is coming down here, at some point here, it starts to uh, it's at its lowest, and then it starts to turn upwards over here. And we are looking for this point over here. That will be the best structure that we ought to have. So that's what we're referring to when we talk about optimal capital structure and the weighted average cost of capital.
I hope that makes sense and I hope it helped.